as you, as you all know, the protection of consumers and the empowerment of entrepreneurs through competition has been the foundation of US innovation policy for decades. And the US Federal Trade Commission has played a central role in setting US policy on consumer privacy and data governance at the federal level. Our speaker today, Terrell McSweeney, and I have to tell you she's real Irish, she's one of her own, <laughs> uh, has come to Ireland in her youth. Our brother has directed plays at the gate, so we can definitely, definitely say you're one of ours, um, Terrell. You. You're very, very welcome here today. Um, has been at the forefront of these developments and has played a key role in the US administration. A lawyer by profession, Terrell has um, served in a number of positions, Deputy Assistant to the President Obama in the Antitrust Division, Domestic Policy Advisor to Vice President Joe Biden on a whole variety of areas like innovation, IP, energy, education, women's rights and in fact other areas as well. And she's also been the um, Chief Counsel for Competition Policy and Intergovernmental inter Relations. And in 2014, she was appointed Commissioner of the Federal Trade uh, Commission. So you can see with her background, she's brought together an amazing amount of experience and expertise to take this position. It's a very warm welcome to you to the Institute, uh, Terrell, and we look forward to your presentation, which is entitled, in a ver very nice title, A US Enforcer's Perspective on Innovation and Technology Policy. And we look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank well, you. Thank you so much for, for having me and, um, <clears throat> and that incredibly kind introduction and very warm welcome. Um, I can't tell you how absolutely thrilled my dad was when I said I am uh, going to stop in Dublin and I have an invitation to speak at the Institute for International and European Affairs. And he said, oh, that sounds amazing. I'm so happy. And I said, no, so am I. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate uh, both the invitation um, and uh, the exchange of ideas, um, but also the really rich work that you're doing here on these provocative issues and, and leading the conversation and policy dialogue. So thank you thank for you. your commitment to that work as well. I think these are issues that we all need to be in a, in a conversation about because they are very complex and they're in profoundly important to how we're going to organize ourselves in the digital economy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about what I know, which is how the US Federal Trade Commission works in this space. Um, some of the things that I think are good about it, some of the things that might be um, not as good. Uh, and, and a little bit about where some of the frontiers are that I think we all need to be collectively thinking about and working on together. Uh, and along with some of the tools um, that I'm familiar with in the US toolbox that I think might be, might be helpful as well. And I think we have time for questions. Yes, right? absolutely. So I'll, I'll try to move through things quickly. Um, I have to start with a usual disclaimer, which is that I am a US Federal Trade Commissioner um, but I am here today giving you my own opinion, not necessarily the official views of the FTC or views that are even possibly shared by uh, my colleague, Acting Chairman Olhausen. Um, but since um, we're down to two members of a five-member commission, I can safely tell you that I, these are the views of 50% of the FTC. <laughs> um, and I would note, because we're in Dublin, that um, my colleague, Maureen Olhausen, is actually also Irish-American, so it's also an all-Irish-American FTC, which is pretty awesome. So I'm going to start a little bit with the evolution of the Federal Trade Commission. I'm going to review, again, some of the strengths and weaknesses of the approach the FTC has used and conclude with uh, the frontiers. But um, first, I want to talk a little bit about time. Everybody's probably like, why are you talking about time? <laughs> um, because I, I want to start there for a second because I feel like these conversations um, use a lot of words some of them very technical. We start making generalizations about technology. We throw around things like neural network and algorithm and data and a lot of other terminology uh, to describe the transformation in the global economy that is underway in this fourth industrial revolution that we're now in. 
Um, and, it's, and it's very easy to get confused by those words or to use them, I mean, platform, what does that even mean anymore, right? And use them in sort of generalized way. I'll be doing it a lot today. Um, but uh, I think the thing to focus on is, is actually a very simple thing, which is, um, which is a thing we all have a lot of experience in. One of the key differences in what's happening now versus what was happening before is actually the velocity at which it's happening. Um, and that's a, that's a time type of issue. And I think we are all familiar with that because we sense it in our daily lives. We sense the uh, pace of, of the technology that we're using and the impact that it's having on our own lives. Um, and I think it, that, that speeding up, if you will, made possible by all this amazing transformational technology is also um, one of the reasons uh, we are sensing in a very personal and human way um, our, our loss of control of it around us. And I think that's the sort of underpinning of a lot of the policy conversation that we're all having in this space. Um, so FTC, I'll get back to time later. But think of it as, as the change underway is, is really one of, of, of time almost literally feeling like it's speeding up. And, and us as humans having a very hard time m managing that change. Um, the FTC uh, is, a, is about 103 years old, which in America is very old. Um, and it's especially old for an independent um, regulator. Uh, we've actually survived um, longer than any other commissions like us. The rest of them have been eliminated over time. Um, and uh, I think the only older one is, is probably the Fed. So, um, I think that's cool because the FTC was actually founded at a time in our country where we're very worried about the economic power of these large vertically integrated companies that were owned by a very small number of very powerful individuals and controlled by them too. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that sounds very familiar in 2017 as a, as a set of concerns. It was given at the time a very broad mandate to protect consumers from unfair competition. And ultimately, we were it added an additional authority to protect consumers from unfair deceptive acts and practices. That didn't actually happen until about 1930. But you know, it, it, it sort of came along as, as an idea of sort of having a generalized consumer protection enforcer who is going to step in and try to fix some of the inequities and imbalances and problems associated with uh, the, the trusts and oligopolies that were running the economy. Um, and, and so how did it happen that, that a commission established for that uh, 103 years ago is now um, a commission that sometimes is referred to as the Federal Technology Commission that serves as a data protection commission that has an office of technology researchers and holds workshops on ransomware and does all of this technology policy work. Well, it's actually pretty simple, um, which is uh, that, that the FTC, I think, quite wisely over time focused on protecting consumers from harms in the marketplace, and it kept moving with them as they moved from a brick and mortar world into the digital world that we're now in. Um, so that's how the FTC landed where it landed with uh, just a very broad mandate that, um, that it sort of used and adapted and, and evolved. Um, and that is the most fundamental and important part of what the FTC does and why I think it is a very successful um, regulator or enforcer in the technology space um, because it also uses the other... Um, feature of its design uh, to a very important purpose. Its other feature is that it's meant to study trends and changes in the marketplace in order to inform its enforcement practice. So um, basically, the, the FTC does this thing over and over again, and I think in, in modern time has done it relatively well, Just it studies the trends and changes in the marketplace, and then it writes reports on things. And, or it sends warning letters, and then ultimately it enforces, and that cycle sort of repeats, right? So um, again, the challenge of the policy conversation that we're in now and the digital economy is that we have to speed up that cycle a lot, right? The study, report, enforce, it has to happen more rapidly. Um, and so again, here we are with that time thing that I think um, is really 
the, the underpinning of the changes that are, that are underway. Um, I, I actually think we have a lot to show for our efforts, though. So in the, in the last um, three or plus years that I've been on the FTC, uh, we've done a report on data brokers, on big data, whether it's a tool for inclusion or discrimination on the Internet of Things. We've initiated our Start with Security initiative, which is about building with security in mind um, all of these new great devices. We have a cross-device tracking report. We've done workshops on ransomware, drones, smart television, financial technology, including crowdfunding, blockchain, and digital currency. Um, and that's just in the last two and a half years. So that's a lot of activity looking at a lot of these changes and helping to inform our enforcement, but also helping to inform the broader policy conversation. So I think it's impressively agile, actually, for a government agency to be able to do that kind of work. And I think that's a really useful quality and attribute to agencies that are trying to keep pace in this environment. Um, and, and I think it's also really important that in learning about how the technology works, um, and one of the things we've also done at the FTC is include technologists and computer scientists in our work now and on our staff so that we have people who are actually experts in the technology we're talking about. Um, we also try to make sure that we're appreciating all the innovation and benefits that are flowing from it, um, rather than uh, focusing always on the cost and the harm. So we want to make sure that we're continuing to balance our understanding of all the great new things that consumers are benefiting from, while at the same time uh, we are identifying some of the harms and risks that we want to avoid. So <clears throat> um, harms is, is a big part of our work. And as an enforcement agency, um, harms is where, quite rightly, our focus is usually placed. Um, the FTC uh, you know, it continues to be very busy in the brick and mortar world. There's plenty of frauds and scams and bad practices going on uh, between people all the time. So we spend some of our resources <coughs> there. But in the online world, we've um, also become known as a privacy enforcer and a data security enforcer. And I think ultimately, and I'll get to this uh, towards the end of my remarks, I think we need to help move everybody towards information governance, which is a slightly broader, broader concept. The FTC's first privacy case was in 1998, and it involved GeoCities, which was unfairly selling users' data without their consent. And since then, we've brought about 500 data security and privacy cases. Um, we've also been given regulatory authority in a limited way over children's that data. So under the US Children Online Privacy Protection Act, uh, we actually write rules governing um, the consent that parents need to give for the collection and use of children's information who are under 13. So our focus is on holding companies accountable for the promises that they make about the information they use and collect, and consistently emphasizing the real role of choice. Um, and over time, the FTC has taken the view that consent, um, which is a really important element of how we approach these issues, can be inferred for collection and sharing and, and use of information um, within consumer expectations. Uh, but it has to be consistent with the context of the transaction and consumers' reasonable expectations. Um, and, and I think in this, in this way, we have supported the evolution of frameworks that require opt-in consent for the collection and sharing of information that we regard as sensitive. And uh, right now, sensitive information, which is a, is a concept that I think can evolve with the marketplace over time, but right now the FTC regards it as uh, content of communications, social security numbers, very important in the US as identifying information, health information, financials inform financial information, children's information, geolocation information, um, and recently in a smart televisions case that we had, we added uh, television viewing information as well. So that, that is a, a, a framework that's requiring an opt-in choice around the collection and use of that information. Um, now, there are certainly pros and cons to the, the US's heavy reliance on an enforcement and sector-based approach to technology policy making. 
Um, in the interest of time, there it is again, time. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip over like literally the hundreds of thousands of pages of scholarly thoughts that have been written about the relative merits of regulation and enforcement and a free market approach to these policies issues. I suspect everybody in this room is kind of an expert on them already. Um, and suffice it to say, there's like a really good and important debate about what frameworks are best. Um, I, I like to, I'd like to argue, I guess, that a fact-based enforcement-oriented approach um, is very pro-innovation, um, and it might be even more pro-innovation than a heavy-handed regulatory approach to dynamic digital markets, because it lowers the costs and burdens on new entrants and maximizes the incentives to innovate. So the FTC's focus is um, economically and technologically uh, informed and is primarily harm-based, but it's also technology neutral, which is a really important component of either a regulatory or an enforcement approach, uh, and sufficiently flexible, as I've just been discussing, to keep pace with the rapidly changing marketplace. Um, you know, I, I do think there are also these issues that, that people study quite carefully of, of industry capture of regulators, um, and those don't tend to arise quite as much in a broad-based enforcement agency. But of course there are drawbacks. Um, I mean, actually our most common complaint is that the FTC doesn't provide clear enough guidance over how and when it is using its generalized authority, so the marketplace doesn't know well enough when we are gonna bring cases. Um, and other critics argue that the agency doesn't confine itself uh, to purely economic harms or that it can't keep pace with innovative and dynamic markets. Um, and those who support more aggressive regulation argue that the FTC's uh, modern mandate is confined to stopping practices inflicting concrete harms to consumers and competition, so the agency can't really address these broader public interest concerns that are also very important components of the, of the technology policy debate. So <clears throat> I'm gonna pause here for a second and note that, of course, um, relying on an enforcement-only approach does not solve all of the problems that we're concerned about. Um, and I'm, I don't want anybody to understand that I am advocating that. Um, instead, I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to point out some of the strengths of the FTC's approach. And of course, the reality in the United States that I think has been relatively successful when it comes to optimizing for innovation is that we have a hybrid approach. So the FTC is an enforcement agency, but we work with expert regulators. Um, those, those issues of um, when an expert regulator writes clear ex ante rules for something versus when we rely on an ex post enforcement framework are really front and center in the open internet debate that we are having once again in the United States. Um, and there, um, I would say, we're about to make a really big mistake because if you rely on an enforcement only approach to protect neutrality and access and non-discrimination on the internet, um, then you really are going to end up with a lot of problems because of the market structure of the way broadband works in the United States we don't have a lot of competition in that market. So we have these very powerful companies that are vertically integrated with a lot of incentives to prioritize their own content or to, to um, engage in, this is a technical term, hijinks. Um, <laughs> you've never used that term, right? <laughs> um, and, and in relying on an enforcement only approach is gonna tee up some of the real weaknesses of an enforcement only approach, which is that it takes us time to detect conduct uh, if we can even detect it at all. We may not have necessarily sector-specific expertise in, in what we're looking at. Um, we, uh, we would have to do a full investigation, um, and that also takes additional time. So you might end up several years after the fact trying to remedy a harm to, say, an entrepreneur who's trying to build a new app um, with almost no remedy that's very satisfying at that point. So I think. Um, it's a nice uh, issue to tee up some of the complexities here. There are certainly situations in which clear ex ante rules are justified. It's particularly true when you're dealing with um, situations of market failure or you're trying to guard some of these public interest concerns like um, speech and access and non-discrimination on the internet that are really outside of a harms-based framework of consumer protection or antitrust law. So. Um, I think I'm gonna move into the frontiers portion and hopefully we still have enough time. I don't know, I, I don't, okay, great. Um, I don't have my watch on. Um, 
and, and, and just sort of think a little bit about some of the really interesting challenges that we're all thinking about and working on as the array of technology um, we use in our lives is growing. Um, first, I think uh, it's important that we remember that all of it's, it's difficult to make generalizations. All of these kinds of technologies are not necessarily the same. And so for both regulators and enforcement agencies like the FTC, the starting point <coughs> should be to make sure that we're understanding the technology that we're talking about uh, before making sort of big generalizations about it. Um, and now I'm going to make some big generalizations about it. So I'll just assert that I understand the technology I'm talking about, uh, which is probably definitely not true. Um, uh, not true in that. I think it's very hard for everybody to understand all these different things. <laughs> Maybe some people are geniuses. Um, so I think the questions we're wrestling with now is, it, you know, how do we make sure that consumers um, who want to benefit from all this innovation and who are benefiting from it have choices and transparency within it? Um, are there additional protections that consumers need? Uh, can no the notice and choice framework continue to be the paradigm for privacy policy, especially when the choice is increasingly this take it or leave it proposition where you have to accept terms of use um, in order to use a service? Uh, and as the technology gets smarter, I think one of the really important questions we're going to be wrestling with is how and when do we protect human agency and decision making? Um, Fortunately, not all of these issues reside within the FTC. Thank God, they're very hard. Um, but a lot of them do. And I think uh, the FTC has some very valuable learning that it can use to inform the discussion in this area that it has evolved as it has evolved along with the marketplace. So um, first, I would argue that we need to continue to protect consumers' notice and choice and ensuring uh, also that the technology is honoring those choices. So in our recent enforcement cases, the FTC has been particularly focused on technology that is essentially thwarting a consumer choice through some sort of clever workaround. This might be a critique of a kind of regulatory approach to some of these issues, that you write a reg that says this, and the technology just moves around it over here, right? So as an enforcement agency with a broad tool, we've been <coughs> looking at these challenges. And in our recent case in Mobi, involving a, a company that was providing advertisements in apps, we looked at the fact that although you might have shut off the geolocation tracking for the app, the technology in Mobi was still tracking your geolocation. And it was doing that by triangulating off of your Wi-Fi connection. So it was a clever technical workaround that allowed them to continue to serve ads that pinned your geolocation. Uh, but we said, look, you can't deceive consumers. If a consumer asserts a privacy choice that says, don't track me, you have to honor that choice. And I think this area is an area the FTC has to be very vigilant in um, and that we need to continue to work in. Our case, in turn, also was very related to that. This was a, a case in, uh, involving the Verizon Super Cookie Program, which was a bunch of tracking uh, that was happening that was very hard to get rid of, or actually impossible to get rid of. And, and there we said, look, you can't deceive consumers and say that you can um, eliminate tracking that's occurring when that's not actually the case. Um, and in our recent case involving smart televisions and Vizio, uh, we said, look, you can't present a notice that you're uh, monetizing every single second of someone's television viewing um, in the, uh, uh, what was it called? It was like the, it was called, the notice was like, um, we, it was like performance and we might be using your information to serve you uh, recommendations. Like that does not capture mm -hmm. what is actually going on there, especially when American consumers at least were pretty surprised to learn that they were being tracked like that and didn't really expect it. So there we have those elements of consumer expectation and context being very important as well. So, um, I think we have to continue to be vigilant, and sometimes the vigilance um, takes the form of actually sending out warning letters ahead of time. So we were actually talking about this um, silver push, you and I were talking about this, Neil, this silver push warning letter that we, we put out. So this is software that um, is actually designed to um, 
gather your television use by turning on the microphone on your phone and listening for audio beacons that are being sent out, right? And it would be in like whatever app that's running it. See, so like, I appreciate the laugh. <laughs> Thank you. It's quite clever. Um, but again, we said, look, you, there's not a way that you can properly explain to people that that's happening to them that we think will work here. So please, app developers in the US, don't do this. <laughs> Um, and again, I mean, I think in the US system, it is flexible enough that if people actually designed a way in which that could be made clear to people, we would allow the, the conduct and the choice. But we need to make sure that consumers really want to consent to that. Um, secondly, we've been looking at cross-device tracking. And one of the areas that I think we need to do a much better job on is uh, making sure that a privacy choice that is made on one device is actually honored across your entire device graph. Because what is now happening is um, it's, uh, most of your profiles are including every device that you access and what you access on it. You can imagine the scenarios where people are doing things on their home computers that they didn't expect to show up on their work computers, um, and that can cause some very uncomfortable situations. So we want to we want to make sure that, that, that we're developing the technology. It doesn't exist yet, but I would like it to. That would allow a consumer choice to be made across their device graph. And I think that we really are in this situation where we're going to need to continue to have the innovation and technology that provides consumers with better controls and choices um, and that provides the privacy innovations in this always on, always connected atmosphere because that's going to be very, very important. I'm going to skip over a little bit here, just in the, in the interest of time, um, and, uh, and say that there are a bunch of other laws in the United States that I think are also really applicable to continuing to protect consumers in our digital economy. Um, and they involve civil rights, protections for equal opportunity, protections against discrimination. And we actually have some pretty robust authorities at the FTC in the form of our Fair Credit Reporting Act, which are requirements that are imposed on companies that are using consumer information um, in ways that um, affect uh, lending decisions that are being made about consumers that can be a very nice model for what frameworks we want to put in place around consumers um, so that they have ample information to know how their data is being used in ways that might affect their actual economic opportunity, their abil ability to buy a house, their ability to be employed, um, their ability um, to be free of, of discrimination <coughs> in the marketplace. See, look at that. I skipped a whole page. It's good. All right. <clears throat> um, I think I'm going to finish up with some of some of what I think we can actually evolve to without new authority and then some of the areas where I think it would actually be very helpful for the FTC to have some additional tools as well. Um, first, uh, I want to start with where I think we can all go. So um, the issues of information and control and economic power and competition associated with the digital economy are far broader than privacy policy. I think everybody in the room knows that. Um, we have had an amazing experience in the last year of elections, both here in Europe and in the United States, that really underscores some of the uh, non-economic, uh, arguably non-consumer protection risks associated with technology that's increasingly pushing us into like-minded groups and curating our lives in ways that are hard to to anticipate, and, and I think those are, are, those are real problems. Um, I also think there's a, a whole host of frontiers here around the, the level of intelligence of the technology that is running algorithms and the impact that that has on the functioning of the marketplace, um, and the accountability that needs to be associated with the companies that are using that technology. So um, we've evolved this concept at the FTC and privacy over time called privacy by design. We didn't come up with it. Um, actually, a wonderful scholar did. Um, and it's been part of the privacy conversation globally now for some time. Um, the notion being that you can't tack on privacy values at the end of the product development life cycle. You have to build with those values in mind all along. Because if you push it in at the end, the technology won't work like that anyway. And in fact, um, we came to it because we, we a lot of our early privacy cases were deception cases, where someone would say, it doesn't do that. And we'd say, yes, it does. <laughs> you can't say that. Um, right? And so building with these values in mind helps you avoid FTC liability. Well, we adapted that framework into our data 
security program. So we've brought hundreds of data security cases in which consumer data wasn't properly secured because a company failed to have proper security practice in place. And we said, look, you, you should also have security by design. And security by design, like privacy by design, means building all along the, the product life cycle with security values in mind because so coders will tell you that all coders don't know security. You need to have people who understand cybersecurity as part of that process, right? And it also means organizationally, you need to have a data security program. You need to have the ability to receive and respond to vulnerabilities. You need to be testing your products. You need to be patching your products, right? You need to have a whole framework in place around how you're securing a connected product or a connected offering. So I think if we can evolve this into governance by design, and then ultimately as the technology gets smarter, ethics by design, we can create uh, governance structures within organizations using technology that are more responsive to some of the public interest values that we all care about. And uh, you know we're, we're having a very vibrant conversation um, all over the world around these. And I think there's a lot of consensus about what some of the elements of this kind of framework would look like. And it includes transparency and choice and explainability. Um, I also think it includes testing, data quality, um, and remediation and mitigation strategies when that's necessary. Uh, and ultimately, as we get into increasingly autonomous technology, it's going to require human minders that can explain what the autonomous <coughs> technology is doing. Because I, I certainly can imagine uh, problems in the future where some regulator or enforcer like the FTC says, well, why did it do that? And the humans say, I don't know, <laughs> right? I don't think that's going to be a satisfying <laughs> answer for anybody in that conversation. So we want to be setting up the systems so that there is an explanation for that and, and that we, we can govern the technology. I am going to wrap it up there uh, <clears throat> and um, simply say that um, it would be, I think, helpful if in the US we had um, the ability to write a privacy regulation. I've supported that in the past. That would be a generalized privacy law that we don't currently have. And I think the FTC would be capable of, of writing that kind of rule. I think it would be helpful if data brokers who are creating all these very detailed profiles about us were required uh, to provide consumer access to that information, and then we had more notice and choice and consent over how that profile um, is used. Um, and that would require in the US legislation as well. I think it would be helpful if the Federal Trade Commission had civil penalty authority. We don't have penalty authority. We can get redress back for consumers, but we can't really fine anybody. So I think that would give us a bigger stick, um, and I would like to wield it. Um, and, uh, and I think, um, we have to continue to have a, a very engaged global conversation around these issues, which is why I'm so grateful to be here today, because we're in a global digital economy. So how we resolve these issues, how we think about what the right policies are, has an effect on all of us, and everybody has a contribution to make. So.